takes a very firm stance and says, use the comparative method or I won't pay any attention to you. Which is a non crazy position to take since the comparative method almost definitionally defines language families. So trying to define language family membership without using the method which we use to define language family membership would take a fair bit of convincing. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it takes a bit of convincing. And the term regular, uninterrupted, intergenerational language transmission is one that comes up a lot when discussing what the comparative method models. It models essentially the ideal case. The idea that language transmission is only intergenerational is problematic. The idea that it isn't interrupted in any way whatsoever is possibly problematic. We haven't defined interrupted. And the notion of regular is again very circular. So Harrison's point is to define a language family, you need to use the comparative method, because the comparative method defines language families in a particular set of circumstances which we have to really admit don't actually hold in the real world very often. But that's what we've got to, to play with. Now the comparative method, we're, we're all familiar with the comparative method and how it works. Who's not familiar with the comparative method? They're familiar enough. So if we say here are some examples of proof of Indo-Europeanness between Sanskrit and English. Those who say, yes, you've done a good job, hand up. Those who say, no, you haven't, other hand up. Those in favor of this being good comparative method evidence. Who says, yes, this is good evidence? Who says, no, this is shoddy methodology? Yeah, the shoddy methodology is weird. Uh, these are far too similar to represent languages that are five and a half, six thousand years different. These are random chance similarities. They're not what they're like. They're fun to spot, but they're not right. They're on the same level as saying telephone is proof of policy. And yes, the correspondence was great, but they, I doubt anyone suspects that the Nepali, English, German, and Russian had an ancestor in which telephone was used. So we need to look at regular correspondences in order to create a convincing argument. And we, we know this stuff. I'm just making sure we've all got the same basis. So we look for words which are, on the face of it, much less similar. But we do find regular correspondence. So Sanskrit, English, and German, in these four words, we regularly find EFF. And if we plot it out, we can say, oh, look, there's evidence of subgrouping for English and German because they both said, share the same uh, P to F chain. So goes the comparative method when applied to sound correspondence. We can add in more words and we again find more correspondences. They're different, but the point is we're finding regular correspondences. The upper set, a word initial, the lower set, a word medial, the difference only being attested in German. The point is, even though, for instance, Udra and Vasa do not look anything as good as the earlier case of Sanskrit hunter and English. Hunter, these show regular correspondences, so we're happy. We can apply the comparative method by looking at verb morphology. This was a, a throwaway line by George Van Dream in one of his books, where he said that given just the uh, aorist verb endings in Nepali, Irish, and Russian, you could establish that they were part of the same family. And when you look at these, there's an awful lot of similarity going on. This is a pretty good case for. We think something's happening, and there's probably more than chance resemblance, especially taken as a set. Especially if we compare to a non-Indo-European language. You put Finnish in, and it doesn't fit. Even the worst of the Indo-European languages there is a much better fit than Finnish. I'll throw Tamil in, and it's equally appalling. It doesn't fit the paradigm. So, the comparative method running on regular correspondences is what we used to define language families. And since that's what we use to define language families, by definition, it's what we have to use if we want to uh, make a case for proof of membership in a language family. Since any similarities we find between languages are either due to inheritance or they're due to contact, they're due to common evolution or they're just random chance. 
And once we've built up that level of similarity in both form and function in the paradigm, we are ruling random charts out reasonably effectively. Uh, this slide, which looks stunningly similar to a slide Sergei Say just showed us, is the point about distance making its work. This is not uh, lexical transitivity for the classes of people, but it looks almost identical. This is uh, Holman and Wickman's analysis of the difference between languages according to distance between languages, depending on whether they are unrelated, related, related to the same genus or dialect of the same language. The point being that, in general, we find dis uh, differences accrue with distance. The closer you are, the more likely you are to be similar to another language. Being related helps, but even if you're unrelated, the closer you are, the more similar you are, typologically. And we think that similarities come not just in the structure, but also in your basic vocabulary. This is a list of words from a 200-item Swadesh list for English, which are those. Uh, it turns out 90% of the English basic word list is loans. So if we're relying on vocabulary to establish relatedness, we've got a roughly 20% error rate right there. The World Loan Word Database, in the languages they examined, came up with a 25% rate of uh, words, including basic vocabulary. Basic vocabulary are uh, semantic categories in blue, and you can see some of them are showing very high rates of borrowability. So, lexicon without correspondences, regular correspondences of the sorts that we use in the comparative method, simply is not a reliable witness, and we'll see more examples of that today. When we come to look at the Pacific, we find a really interesting thing happening with the lexicon. This is a chart that Sir Wiekman produced, where he produced a metric of roughly lexical diversity compared to the number of languages in the family. And the correlation between number of languages and level of lexical diversity is high. It correlates at 0.5, except for Austronesian. The inclusion of Austronesian makes that correlation crash because Austronesian is way less diverse lexically. Its number here is 35, which should belong two-thirds of the way up the chart. Austronesian is way less diverse lexically than its size would have you imagine. So there is something going on with the lexicon in Austronesian. What sort of something? Now, the comparative method deals with regular inheritance, but it doesn't very thoroughly deal, other than by identifying, contact. And yet we know there's all sorts of ways contact can affect the language. What I'm going to propose to you is that we can really talk about different histories in a language. We just saw a uh, illustration of the 90% of basic vocabulary in English, which is loans. The lexicon is showing a different history to the history of case or the history of uh, verbal inflection. We could imagine a situation where in the ideal world in which the comparative method breeds and grows so well that the lexicon descends directly from whatever was there in the past. And similarly, the morphous syntax and the phonology show direct, uncomplicated descent. In the real world, of course, every language shows a bit of change. There's always a sound change. Perhaps the phonology loses or gains a segment. It's a tad askew. But there's some level of acceptable level of difference, at which point we're not suspicious of anything that's happened. It could be that in addition to the phonology, the morphosyntax is a bit off from what they're expecting. It could be that the morphosyntax is fine, but the lexicon and the phonology don't look like anything we were expecting. At this point, we're having trouble with language classes. It might be that the phonology and morphosyntax intensified and the lexicon is all different. This would be a case of relexification. At which point, it doesn't make that much sense to say this is a orange family language or a green family language. We would logically have to say that this is a language with different histories. Different parts of the language show different histories. <coughs> this could be English with a small number of loans, but the point is, 
The direct descent is neat, it's nice, and it's uncomplicated. But once we start <coughs> seeing the elements that were not predicted from the reconstructed proto-language or the historical records, whatever we have, we have to at some point say, well, that much doesn't fit. All those black elements are the bits that worked well, and the white parts of those bars are the bits that we didn't have an etymological explanation for. And when we add all of those together, the, the sum total of language that we're observing isn't actually very much if we're assigning it to this language family. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't assign it to that language family, but we should consider a multiple history explanation for whatever language we're looking at. And this would be true of every language in the world. All languages have some level of contact with someone else. And to simply say it belongs here or there obscures a lot of interesting facts. If we come and look at the Western Pacific and the Austronesian languages, there's a reconstruction to Proto-Malayo-Polynesian, which is all the Austronesian languages outside Taiwan. Taiwan is in purple up there. Uh, the reconstruction to Proto-Malayo-Polynesian is Kaliwati or Kalati, and it means earthworm. The reconstruction for Austronesian is Kulay, or Kulay. The Kulay term is only attested in Taiwan. The, re the only reconstruction we have for Proto-Austronesian is Kulit, but there is no attestation of that on any language outside Taiwan. Outside Taiwan, we find a lot in green of languages with this Kaliwati term. From a Malayo-Polynesian perspective, the Kaliwati term is completely normal and what we expect. It's very common out in the Pacific as well. From an Austronesian perspective, all these languages that the Kaliwati term have a lexeme that has no explanation. It was replaced. But that's okay. Replacement happens to some extent. We have to consider describing the history of these languages in terms of what is attributable to the ancestor and also what is not. Now you notice the Austronesian word isn't attested in the non-Austronesian languages of New Guinea. That's perfect. But all of these languages are Austronesian as well, and none of them are testing a Kalati or Kalawati term. There's another term, though, Chachi, which is found in Western Indonesia in a whole range of languages. Languages from the North Sumatra group, Batak languages, Nias, Malayic languages, Sundanese, Javanese, Madaris, Balinese, uh, at least three major subgroups of Malay and Polynesian. And this term chaching is not found anywhere else, and no one has proposed that it be reconstructed in Malayo-Polynesian, because all the attestations are so close to each other that we can't do our contact as a means of maybe it was innovated in one group and then spread. But the one problem is Proto-Malayo-Polynesian did not have a ch. There was no ch in Malayo-Polynesian, and this term is appearing with a segment that isn't reconstructed anywhere back there. And yet the languages of mainland Southeast Asia have a lot of palatal sounds, and we do indeed find at least one language with a plausible chaching related word. So despite the absence of any ch in Malayo-Polynesian, we're finding fairly basic vocabulary with this term in the area closest to mainland Southeast Asia. And this isn't a huge surprise. I mean, English has 90% of basic vocabulary as low as Why can't a number of languages of Western Indonesia? In terms of the uh, diagrams we saw before, here's just a little bit of lexicon that we had no explanation for. The morphosyntax we're happy with, the phonology we're, well, the phonology we're not completely good with because we acquired new further. But there's only a little, a snippet, a snippet that's not working, a tiny part that isn't looking uh, canonically Austronesian. But when we look further in the lexicon, we find some disturbing patterns. This is the percentage of basic vocabulary, 200 items, that's retained from proto malayo polynesian reconstructions. Now, all languages change, so about a 50% hit rate is roughly what you find in Western Europe as well. Germanic languages at a 50 to 60% rate of Indo-European retentions, that's doing quite well. So that's, 
That's pretty much all the standard. And we do attest languages with that level of retention here in the Philippines, looking good in Sumatra. The next level up, the reds. That's how you do it. Where do you see red languages? Languages with a high level of lexical retention. Where are they found? Close to your home and out, outside of uh, Papua New Guinea. We heard it everywhere, a close to homeland and a not near New Guinea. Basically, not near New Guinea gets you yeah. the best explanation. Come close to New Guinea and it's fairly disastrous. We're less than 20% retention. But they're creeping right up, right onto mainland New Guinea and they're finding them, just not so frequently. So rather, I say, where do you find the red languages? But if I say, where do you find the white languages? That's a much easier story. They're in Melanesia, they're in New Guinea, and they're not looking great in some strange areas as well. But it's a messy picture, but we're seeing a very low rate of lexical retention close to New Guinea. What would be an explanation for this? Why would these languages have only about 25% of their vocabulary Austronesian, while out here in Sumatra, we're looking more like 40 to 50%. Why is that different from that? Language shift. Could be language shift. Could be some sort of contact situation which applies differently. I, I agree with you, I think. Language shift was proposed. Could be heavy influence, could be who knows what. But we've got differential contact situations. Crucially though, we're seeing the same in the interior of Borneo as well. Here we have lots of non austronesian languages to point the finger to and say, ah, language shift or heavy contact or something. Here everyone's Austronesian. But the lexical retention rates, at least, suggest that something happened in the past. Something socially happened that caused, either caused a quick, turnover, a quick turnover of words or there was a pre austronesian society there which survived long enough to influence the vocabulary. Whether it was through language shift or uh, lots of loans coming in, we don't know. But we haven't yet addressed the comparative method point of regular sound correspondences. So finding cognate vocabulary, yes? This is retention of Malayo-Polynesian, and the Taiwanese languages aren't Malayo-Polynesian. Nice. Yeah, so, uh, so sorry. Uh -huh. yeah, so this isn't Austronesian retention. The reason I did not plot Austronesian retention is there is so much replacement out of Taiwan that everything here becomes very boring. And we right. need to pick up this pattern so well. So when we're examining words, we have to look for regular correspondences. If a protophoneme X comes out as some derivative of X in some environment Y, we're happy. It could stay the same, it could change, doesn't matter. If, on the other hand, one phoneme turns into either X or X double prime, and we cannot predict that change, then we have trouble. At that point, we don't have regular sound correspondences the same way that we're hoping to find. Uh, the study I'm about to show you just looks at initial plosives. Initial sonorants don't change an awful lot. Intervocalic or final things change a lot. So initial plosives is an happening here. That would be completely regular if that's what happens. That would be completely regular. But changing to both B and P would be a level of irregularity. So, for instance, if we took these Austronesian reconstructions, Batu, Bulan, Buluk, Bibir, and Barsi, Barsai, meaning stone, moon, body hair, lips, and paddle. If we were examining a language where they were uh, reflected as batu, bulan, pulu, bibi, bose, we would be able to say that based on this data, everything's regular except the pulu. Let's assume for the moment that the U is not a conditioning factor, which we haven't proven. 
that would mean that they're 80% regular. Just on this data. This wouldn't be enough data to go to town on, but it's, it's a start. So that language would be 80% regular. This language would be what? This would be 60%. And a language like this would be what? Also 60, exactly. Uh, if we changed the uh, reflex of uh, Bolok to Wulu, at that point we dropped down to 40. So yes, we're not caring whether it changes or not, just the regularity. Uh, some real world examples, on the left you have Malay or Indonesian, that's 100% regular, even though only 4 out of 4 were attested, because Dairon is clearly a replacement, so we can't assess that. Look up the C, 4 out of 5, so 80% regular, since Rather than Bose, they have Bose for pattern. And in Peluche, in the south, it's 100% regular for this set of data. Uh, what I then did was take 200 items, uh, a fairly basic word list, examine the regularity of all these process. For calibration purposes, this is what uh, European languages look like if you do this, obviously not with Austronesian reconstructions. This is with Indo European reconstructions. These are the levels of regularity you expect to see. Really strikingly was for a basic word list, the Germanic languages were 100% there. Nothing irregular in a basic list. The lowest we've got looks to be Serbo-Croatian at 84%. So this is looking at P and B, T and D, any initial plosives. The group average is 96%. Since the comparative method and its reliance on regular correspondences was based in Europe, we can say that this is our gold standard. Get a 90% pass rate and we're happy. Okay. Calibrating on Uralic languages, we found pretty much the same result. 94%. Close enough to the same thing. I'm then going to plot them according to how regular they are with a cumulative graph. So plotting Nothing, 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 some, more, or lots. Yes? Which standard is counted in several parts? Whichever one was in Buck's Dictionary of Proto Indo European. So this is the profile of Uralic and Indo European uh, according to these measures. There's nothing, none of the languages are very irregular. And all of them fit at the 80% above line. These are smoothed lines. Adding in some other families, we see some interesting patterns. Dravidian in yellow is not so regular. Austronesian in garish pink is showing a very different profile. And crucially, Austronesian has languages at below 50%, which is definitely a fail grace. It turns out. If I just look at Austronesian compared to our starting calibration sample of Indo-European and Uralic, turns out that it's actually best to model Austronesian in terms of a complex polynomial. There are two curves which intersect. And that curve is basically the regularity pattern that we saw in Indo-European and Uralic. This is something different. Some of the data is doing exactly what we expect. Some of the data represents a different population with a much lower level of regular correspondence, a level which is unattested in Western Europe. Yeah, but these numbers for the European are kind of circular in that uh, the, 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 the items that, 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 are, you, uh, that, that, that yeah. are found in the dictionary are precisely those items that show regular sanction. And yet still, and, and and because of that, items which were not. Yes, but but so so yeah, I brought the point. Uh, because they 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 do it in order to do, to to uh, to reconstruct for for the Europeans. So if they they can't have items in there that uh, that have uh, okay maybe it doesn't work. And yet the Uralic example shows the same pattern. So we should really take Uralic as the uh, as the calibration point. My point is there are languages which show that very high level of regularity. Mm. Which we're <coughs> Austronesian, on the other hand, shows that high level of regularity for some of the sample and doesn't for some other sample. So here's the 75 Austronesian languages I examined. 
colored according to how regular the correspondences were. Mm -hmm. So the previous map was how much lexicon do you retain? This map is of your retained lexicon, how regular are the sound correspondences? The European and Uralic level of regularity is up to here. Orange, yellow, and white is unattested in Uralic or Europe. What can you tell me about the distribution of colors on this map? Hmm. So, New Guinea is a thing, or Yeah, New Guinea, maybe we don't have a story. Here, there's a nice... We can see a good level of mostly regular languages in the north and coming down here. And then once we get out here, we're dropping, but dropping either radically or a little bit. Radically or a little bit. Dropping completely off. Right next to a perfectly regular language. So in this corridor here, the big islands, Sumatra to Borneo to the Philippines, the languages are behaving. Once we get out here, it's a mixture of well-behaved and completely unbehaved languages. And the unbehaved is also what we see on the mainland of New Guinea, uh, mainland of Asia. On the mainland of Asia, which are very recently arrived languages, we also see a complete drop of regularity. Now, we know the story in uh, Hainan, which is that one, and in Chun, is that a large number of local people acquired the language. So we know this is a case of complex language shift situation. That may be the case here as well. There are multiple scenarios. My point is, there's a very complicated story when we try to apply the comparative method to Austronesian languages. Yes, we can do it, and we should do it. And later I'll show you a brilliant example that someone else did. But there's a lot of data which does not fit very well. If we choose the right data, this language, Bima, will look just as good as anything that's Germanic if we only include those lexemes which are regular. But we have to define regular because at below 50% there's nothing left. All of these can be made to look good with selective pruning, which is often the process in historical dictionaries. But overall, we're seeing a pattern which is geographically motivated of well-organized languages which appear to have something very close to regular uninterrupted descent in terms of the lexicon, and languages which are good enough. I mean, that is either that or that. It's 85, 95% regular. That counts. But right next door for someone who is down at between 50 and 70%. Out here, it's not the case that we had a different social history. But clearly, out in the east of Indonesia, as we approach New Guinea, there were different social histories. There were multiple histories in different locations. And there is no one story here, the way there does appear to be just one story in the Philippines. So we have to start digging around a bit. All of those languages which are below the European or Uralic levels of regularity say that there is a complex contact history. They say that even though they may be, for many of them, in areas where we no longer have a plausible donor language, there is something out, something in their history which affected their, the transmission of sound. If it was a case of language shift, you would not expect this pattern. Simple language shift, they would shift to a language and the words would be applied. If it was a case of multiple stages of language shift, we might get there. Some words arrive, they're assimilated. Some more words arrive from another source, they're assimilated. No one's keeping track of correspondences because they don't know what they are. That might happen. The point is, it's complicated. So some areas have a high level of retention of both basic vocabulary and some don't. Some areas show high levels of regular correspondence, some don't. And we haven't addressed an awkward case of regular correspondence, which is shown in this data. Here's some number of English words, looks to be about 20 English words. Here they are in a, another language. There are regular correspondences all the way through. You can see just some of them outlined there. 
is this a case of regular self correspondence and therefore comparative method says perfect descent from Germanic? I'll guess what this language is. Maybe this is top -lisson. Top -lisson. Yeah. So this is top a Melanesian Creole. By these metrics, it's a good case of a Germanic language. It's 100% regular. By massive collapse of contrast, all the way. So the thing to keep in mind is we've just established a large level of regularity in many languages. But we have established that with a Creole as well. And we know that's a case of language shift, which means we have a complex history again. Another problem, even if we don't go near this extreme example, is very many semantic fields are really poorly attested, both in modern Austronesian languages and, more critically, in Proto-Austronesian. So from a lovely chapter by Andy Pauly, here's this of reconstructed terms for clothing. That's, this is what they're reconstructed for in Proto-Austronesian, the ancestor language in Taiwan. Here are the reconstructions outside Taiwan. Pretty good matchup. Here's the word Tudung, which isn't found in any languages of Taiwan. A little bit of change. Basically, it looks pretty good. One fly in the ointment is the irregular sound correspondences, where the velar nasal became a coronal nasal, and the uvula r in barita became an l. Okay, a little bit of a regular sound correspondence, but the lexemes are showing culture, history retained over time. Here are some terms which were found out into uh, Proto-Oceanic, came from Proto-Malayo-Polynesian, but were not attested in, <coughs> as reconstructions in proto austronesian That's fine, this comb, presumably there was another comb there which didn't get preserved in a large number of uh, subgroups. That's all right. If we look at cooking terms, again, it looks quite decent. We've got regular correspondence for all four of those cooking terms. And then we have some, uh, the dogs were a food source for uh, the Austronesians, so they were included in the cooking section. Uh, dogs are attested. Uh, we have two kinds of pigs. This was a wild pig and a domesticated pig. Since the pigs were introduced by humans into the Pacific, we see retention of the domesticated pig term, but obviously no retention of the wild pig term. Because who would be foolish enough to take a wild pig on a canoe with them, right? That's not going to happen. That all looks quite good. Here are the terms known for cutting implements. We've got a large number of reconstructions for proto malayo polynesian all of which were retained into Oceanic and then they dribble off as we drop to lower level subgroups, Proto Central Pacific and Proto Polynesian. Not a single one is reconstructed to Proto Austronesian. The entire semantic field of uh, cutting implements and cutting actions is replaced outside Taiwan. There is no retention of Proto Austronesian terminologies. 100% exchange of that semantic field. Nothing there at all that survived. Same story, right? All of the pottery terms, and recall pottery has been suggested as a proxy for the language dispersal, all of the pottery terms that we can attest in the Philippines, in Indonesia, and out into the Pacific in many cases, are not found on Taiwan. It's a completely different culture history. Fishing. Yes, there's some fishing reconstructed to proto austronesian but again, this looks like we have a completely different culture in terms of the, um, the word history of these languages. The Taiwanese were not maritime people. At contact and all through the Chinese records, the Thai Chinese never recorded Taiwanese people sailing except one time when there was an uh, outrigger canoe that was being sailed to the Philippines in the 1700s and it was picked up by a navy vessel and they admitted that it was a boat that someone from the Philippines had sailed up. The Taiwanese were not ocean traveling. It gets even worse when we look at actual canoe words 
of the huge range of terms for canoes and things to do with canoes in Malay Polynesian, only two are attested in Proto-Austronesia. <laughs> Again, we do not have a maritime culture. Of the uh, food items, root crops, that are found in uh, Indo-Malaysia and Oceania, only two are descended from terms that are attested in Taiwan. Again, the, the picture you get is of a completely different culture. If we reconstructed the world and world view of these people, it would be radically different from our reconstruction of the proto austronesian world. All we can attest for root crops are sugarcane and taro in Taiwan. And we have this whole suite of terms outside. What has been associated with uh, Austronesians in Taiwan is the presence of a rice culture. And there's a complex series of terms for rice, rice cultivation, stages of rice. This is looking a little bit better. As you can see, the Proto-Austronesian and the proto malay polynesian terms match up. So yes, we've got different biogeographic zones, kind of, and different root crops, but the rice terminology, the grain cultivation, is looking a lot better. Until you look at the details. So in Nicole Rev's book, uh, Veronique Arnaud writes about the people of uh, Formosa, which is Taiwan, and points out that prior to rice, millet was the food of choice and the food retained in ceremonial uses. Even more to the point, she includes a lovely table showing the reference for taro, cooked taro, cooked millet, and cooked rice in a number of languages of Taiwan. And you'll notice that very often what refers to cooked rice is cooked millet. What refers to cooked rice is cooked millet, etc. In other words, these terms do not mean cooked rice, and they do not mean cooked millet. They mean cooked grain of some sort. Here in Yanni, uh, where rice has never been a part of the diet, millet and uh, taro are the same term. And you'll notice that nimei and hemei, sumai, they're etymologically the same through regular correspondence. What we're seeing, rather than strong evidence for a rice culture, is strong evidence for food. We can unequivocally say that Proto-Austronesians have food. <laughs> A story for the change in terminology has been beautifully proposed by Michel Ferry of CNRS when looking at the Austroasiatic languages. He points out that there's a set of terms which shift reference as you go from north to south on mainland Southeast Asia. The Palaujic languages in the north have terms referring to species of taro which clearly reflect his proposed Sorok term and through regular correspondences, there are some others there as well. When we look in the south, we find these rock related terms referring to paddy rice. Occasionally, in the center of Vietnamese, we see it referring to uh, taro still. So his proposal is that sorok originally meant taro. It shifted reference to rice. Uh, around the saw people, it is sarok. And then in the south, proto vatuic its only reference is rice. If we consider this not as a word referring to the grain rice or the paddy rice, but as the staple crop, this makes perfect sense. The term sarok simply refers to staple food, food staple. Returning to Austronesian, well, the shamai term we have to exclude because it refers to millet as much as it refers to rice. It's not actually evidence for a suite of rice terms. Uh, the seed term is just the general word for seed. Yes, it's a seed for planting rice, but it's also a seed for anything. It's not a rice-specific term. Which leaves us with just two words that survive into Malayo Polynesian and are really possibly reconstructed, just Hade and Baras. Uh, of those, they shall I be eliminated because it's generally replaced outside Taiwan. There's about two or three languages total that retain it. The Padjai term is the source of the word Padjai, as it happens. And the Baras term looks very good. That's the most regularly retained term in Austronesian languages. The problem with Baras is it's also the term attested all across uh, the Himalayas. 
It's a term all throughout Sino Tibetan and the modern languages. So it appears to be a bond of words which has no actual value for determining linguistic history in any one family. So the entire uh, rice wheat actually crumbles when you examine it in detail. Uh, the other food which I forgot to mention yesterday when I was showing you the historical pathways of material, culture, and foods, taro. Taro was first cultivated in New Guinea 7,000 years ago, first cultivated, first bred for cultivation, but there's evidence of wild taros being distributed through human agency from New Guinea to mainland Asia, from mainland Asia back to New Guinea over at least the last 10,000 years. So that doesn't give us, give us any story, but it does give us a story for an independence, uh, independence uh, development of agriculture. Now, while I'm on the aside, uh, the other big point which was raised with me yesterday was how we actually address the mismatch of dates. It's been assumed that when we don't have written sources, that a language spread equals the spread of people, and that the spread of people involves the spread of a culture. And the spread of culture involves something archaeologists can find in date, like pots. And therefore, the spread of culture is attested in the artifact dispersal, and so the artifact dispersal is a good way of dating the spread of language, <coughs> is the argument made. It is, of course, actually very circular, and we can't actually date anything linguistically unless we find something big and beautiful, like this heavily inscribed superpot in a museum in Sumatra. But this, unfortunately, is only 1,300 years old, so it doesn't help us early on. The point about all of this food stuff is the food stuff is terminology that refers to a cultural event not to a real-world object. It's something like stable food or thing cooked in the way that we like to eat it. That these crops are heavily, heavily involved in ceremonial uses in Melanesia. We see bananas, banana and sugar cane are actually the ones very commonly you refer to as the, the real food that you use in ceremonies all throughout Eastern Indonesia. Rice is a very recent comer. Taro, is not so popular these days, Sago is incredibly popular in cultures that use it for ceremonial reasons, at least as much as nutritional reasons. Uh, the other aside I promised I'd do was here's the list of things that make Indo European distinct, drawing on a Wall's uh, sample of features and comparing to other language families in Eurasia. These are the features that show different distributions in Indo European. Okay, that's there, got that on the record. Back to the story. We still want, even though we have trouble with the application of it, to use the comparative method, since that is our gold standard. And this is a lovely study that an ex-student of mine, Owen Edwards, did on the Rote Meto languages. These are languages in southern Indonesia down there. This is significant because in this part of the world, there are a number of non austronesian languages still attested. So in a sense, anything that's happening that's odd in the Timor area is something that we can point circumstantially to non-Austronesians as a source of confusion. Now, in a paper published earlier this year, Owen examined sound correspondences between mainland Timor and the island of Rote. The island of Rote and mainland Timor are areas which uh, perform identity a lot. There are particular cloths, particular hats you have to wear, and speech is a very intricate part of identity. Owen did the classic comparative method business and found a huge number of regular sound correspondences in a large amount of vocabulary. This is just a sample. Constructed trees, worked out how everything fitted together. Lovely. And the summary, for your benefit, is essentially the, uh, and I should mention, Kupang Malay is a recent uh, Malay variety, so they're not counting that at all. Helong, is Austronesian but doesn't appear to be closely related to anybody. There's a completely different set of sound correspondences. So what I say has nothing to do with that. Uh, short summary. The languages of central and eastern Rote form a subgroup. The languages of western Rote and mainland Timor form another subgroup. This is established by regular sound correspondences, sound change in rock-solid uh, Malayo-Polynesian etima as reflected from these languages. 
that this is unproblematic and Owen lays out the data rather beautifully in the Journal of Southeast Asian Linguistic Society. And so we have a story for the subgrouping of this area. And of course, as a low-level subgroup, there are a number of lexical items which aren't reconstructed back to proto malay polynesian but are shared between the lengths in the area. And again, we establish that central and eastern Rote form one subgroup, western Rote, Benga and Oinale and Dela form a subgroup with Meko. Owen is a very thorough person, so in addition to his top-down historical phonology of Rote Meto, where he examined Austronesian etymon and how they were reflected and what comparative method story we got, he has a paper in press at the moment called Parallel Histories in the Rote Meto. And the short summary of that is, when we examine the words that do not have Austronesian etymologies, we subgroup differently. We subgroup such that rather than central and eastern Rote forming a group versus west and mainland, instead we find central and west Rote subgroup against eastern mainland. This, this is established through examining regular sound correspondences, positive changes, etc., etc., perfect textbook comparative method. An illustration of that, Proto B. Proto B, when tested in Etymon that had reconstructions to Proto Malayo Polynesian, comes out as F across Western Rote, Central Rote, Eastern Rote, and Mainland Timor. Proto B, when it tested in words that do not have an Austronesian etymology, comes out as F in the Far West and the Far East, but as an implosive in Central Rote and Eastern Rote. proto nasal when attested in words which have Austronesian etymologies, is attested as N all the way across. It is a massive collapse of sonorants now to N. However, other instances of proto nasal when attested in words that do not have Austronesian etymologies, surface as a K in the metro varieties, while it's N all the way across the Proto-K in Austronesian reconstructions shows a rather complex history, but the Far West and the Far East both show, both reflect K as an H. But when the K is in a reconstruction that does not have an Austronesian etymology, we see a very different pattern. An example of some of the words which we're looking at, you can see here, the two on the left, Nis Nis and Anin, have Austronesian etymologies and we see the vela nasal reflected as an N all the way through. The two on the right do not have Austronesian etymologies, and we see a different pattern of sound correspondence. So, let me just go back to the mathematical area. So what is found here is these languages, which no one has ever suggested were anything other than Austronesian, subgroup together. They subgroup together through the application of the comparative method, regular sound correspondences, sound change, subgrouping, all of that. And we find the slightly unusual situation that the metal cluster and western rote subgroup together against here. However, when we examine the words which do not have Austronesian reconstructions, we find a different subgrouping created through a different set of sound correspondences. There's a two parallel histories. In the, lexical, in the lexicon of these languages. The Austronesian history tells one story. The lexicon that cannot be attributed to, to Austronesian tells a completely different story. So let me just jump ahead a little bit. Where am I? So the words themselves are not great evidence for Austronesian because once we've established two simultaneously existing sets of sound correspondence, we don't actually know which ones are the correct sound correspondences. If this is an Austronesian language, then roughly 40% of the vocabulary operates under a different set of sound correspondences. If this is a non-Austronesian language, 
then roughly 60% of the vocabulary operates under a different set of sound correspondences. It's not working very well. This is an example I attested in 2013. It's too not to repeat. Uh, across the radio, we heard whistle bug, forest ranges near mountain lane called Nestor Bag near Listor DI. Which language was this broadcast in? I think the answer has to be heavily relaxed by Hindi. But if we're relying on the words, then uh, the forest tells us that we're dealing with a romance language. I'm not sure what Lion's telling us. Uh, but we're not getting a very Indic story out of this, if we look at the lexemes. If we look at the grammatical morphology, we're getting more Indic story. The words themselves are not really great. So a point I want to make about this adaptation is on the one hand, very different to what I've just been talking about, but I think it's the best analogy I know. About 30,000 years ago, wolves started self-domesticating to become dogs. Archaeologists believe that the wolves started hanging around, humans threw them literally in bones, and over a period of time, humans adapted to dogs, uh, to wolves, wolves adapted to humans, and we ended up with water copies. This was a 30, 35,000 year old process and it resulted in highly intelligent animals. Now about 50, 55 years ago, Dmitry Beliaev started a project in Novosibirsk. And the project in Novosibirsk involved buying Arctic foxes from fur trappers and keeping them. And he and his assistants kept careful note every month of exactly what was going on when they went to feed the foxes, when they passed the cage of the fox. Would the fox snap at their fingers? Would the fox approach? Particularly, would the fox of its own approach the human as the human went by? This was what was being selected for. Those animals which most successfully were friendly were allowed to breed. And over 30 years, the foxes which were the friendliest, you can see that fox looking very friendly with Dmitri, bred and bred, and they turned from that into that. Now, yes, that's a black and white photo, but you'll notice the very symmetrical marking on the body, a much fluffier um, coat, the ears are much larger. These are all neonatal characteristics that have been bred into dogs in order to make them more appealing to humans. They look more like babies. If you compare a wolf to a dog, the dog looks younger and it invokes our maternal instinct. In only 30 years, not being selected for any physical characteristic, the foxes replicated this. The foxes were bred only on the basis of behavior. And they ended up with something that looks as cute as Japanese manga comics could ever create, just outrageously cute creatures, which show dog-like characteristics of playing with balls and bouncing and behaving. Well, I mean, who doesn't want one? I'm sure, sorry. Uh, you can buy them. For about 10,000 US, they will ship to anywhere in the world, since in these days there's no longer so much central funding. The big point is, on the left, we have 35,000 years of partly self-selected breeding. On the right, we have 30 years of very concentrated behavioral breeding, producing exactly the same, or as close to as you can, the same phenotypical response in the body of the animal, without breeding for physical characteristic at any point. We can achieve a very similar result from very different roots if the pressure is right. What we end up calling that, well, these are different species, they cannot interbreed, but we have achieved something which, from an even more than casual inspection, looks very close to the same thing. Certainly, these two look more like each other than either of them look like the ancestors. Hypothetical question is what to call this form. Does it look more dog or more wolf? Or more fox? Who votes most like a dog? Most like a wolf? There was a hesitant hand there. Most like a fox? A bit of popularity here. I call him Flash, but never mind. He's, he's actually one of these, but it shows that books can be heavily deceiving. The ability to adapt to be like something else is 
heavily repeated. We take a small Eastern Indonesian test case, the Olin Peninsula shows interesting patterns in its horrible and dorsal stops. We start by looking at some languages around the Olin Peninsula. These are all Austronesian languages which are spoken in the area. Come from two different subgroups of Austronesian, possibly three. They're all in the area. This is the closest system that these languages have. There's nothing particularly outstanding, really. Kasui having a single prenasalized stop is odd, but prenasalization slowly creeps in one sentence at a time in Indonesia. Geser, is it Geser? No, Kasui, sorry, Geser has the prenasalized stop. Kasui has a dental versus alveolar contrast in its coronals. That's a little unusual globally, but it's actually very common in Indonesia. A global stop here or there, some missing P's in some languages, but nothing particularly exciting. Uh, compared, compared to Proto-Austronesia, which had that closest system, it's a completely different world. You would not have predicted this on the basis of those languages, or nor would you have predicted those languages on the basis of this, without a lot of collapses in sound correspondences. All those, I dare in the end, the kind of collapses you saw between English and top pieces of earlier. So, uh, the um, dental versus alveolar contrast, this is where we find languages showing the pattern in Kasui of having a dental T and an alveolar D, I think. No, no idea what that is, ignore it. Now we look at the Onion Peninsula itself, this sticky out part. These are one, two, three, four, five, six more Austronesian languages from the Olympian Peninsula area. What do you notice about these compared to the Austronesian languages there? And these languages come from exactly the same subgroups of Austronesian that those languages come from. Are they exactly the same? Not at all. So, let's hear a contrast. Prenasalization is featuring at all places. Not in every language, but we're testing it all over the place. Uvular consonants. Oh, yes, and even more, this language name is actually Uruanihin. It uvularizes wherever it can. Its dorsal stops, instead of being pronounced as velas, are pronounced as uvulas. There's lots of rounded consonants, both uh, labial, bilabial and velar. And finally, Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes. These uh, co-articulated stops. Yeah, yeah. I also want to draw your attention to the dental articulation for all of their coronals. Up there, for Kasui, we found one half of the coronal system is dental. But on the Onion Peninsula, everything is dental. Why? Again, these languages are in the same subgroup as those languages. We have the rounding, we have the dental articulation, we have the uvulas, we have the prenasalization, and we have four non-Austronesian languages of the same area, the Onion Peninsula. Showing the co-articulated stops, the prenasalization, the dental articulation, a tendency towards uvularization. Now, these are Austronesian languages as established through certainly a decent amount of lexicon and in some cases some semi-decent sound correspondences. These are not Austronesian languages, but are all related to each other. And according to oral histories, have been there at least six and a half thousand years. Do we have any explanation for the unusual features in these languages? Language shift. Language shift, language context, something. I suspect language shift is likely to be the answer since we see an awful lot of lexicon as well. And this is repeated and this is repeated. Now, establishing language familiness. This is a, uh, an abstract of a quote from Michael Newman that we need related languages are related through a common ancestor. 
hence language family or suffering or something of those lines. And following Newman's formulation, this requires us to establish, to examine for regular correspondences and to look at the essential character of the languages. And that's how we would exclude Tophism as a Germanic language. It's very different. It's not showing a level of morphosyntactic descent that we predict. It's completely different. Newman constructs in prose a table where he says essentially that the normal case for a related language is the essential character. Let's take that as grammatical characteristics, match what you expect, and there are regular sound correspondences. And if it's a completely different language typologically, and there are no correspondences, then it's not related. But that leaves us, leaves us with two intermediate cases. The essential character always sounds very 19th century to me. It's something I hate to defend in print, but I'm willing, it seems, to discuss it in talks. So I'm not 100% horrified by it for reasons that are complicated. But the point is we can start to unravel social histories. If instead of just saying you're this family or that family, we can say, okay, you're, you don't have a good set of regular sound correspondences, but you look like the right kind of language. Maybe you've got some poor vocabulary items, even if the sound correspondences aren't great. You've got a nice set of pronouns. Uh, maybe you're showing the phonological characteristics. You don't have tone, and you do have an ultimate stress. But your sound correspondences aren't there, so good marks for trying, but heavy contact situation, maybe language shift, maybe massive substrate, we don't know what. The pigeon creole situation is also a big possibility. The sound correspondences are there, as we saw in Topism, but the morphosyntax and the phonology just aren't matching what we expect. This is assuming an idea of some level of expectedness that we can draw upon. And I don't think we have that very well, but it's actually not hard to operationalize, as I might have time to show on, the, on Friday. So lots of questions about how much is regular. We've sort of addressed that. Noonan quite explicitly addresses the essential nature question, that certain characteristics should be transmitted along, along a genetic line for it to be a member of a taxonomic unit. Sounds a bit waffly, but it's actually not far from the notion of regular, uninterrupted intergenerational language transmission, which is regularly discussed in historical linguistics textbooks. Nothing major disrupted the chain, which meant there were no overwhelming influences from outside to create a different typological profile. And we've seen this applied by linguists we respect. So Kavi, a written language of uh, Southeast Asia, was identified as being Austronesian despite having something like 70% Sanskrit in its written form, by the fact that the grammatical structure, the essential character of the text, did not look Sanskrit. It was verb initial. There were prefixes that match prefixes attested in other Austronesian languages, etc., etc. The question, of course, is how much is too much, and what are we looking at anyway? What, what, are, these, what are these features we're examining to determine essential nature? You've got to be very careful to be objective in this. So if I showed you this set of data and asked you the question, and this is the only data you have, is Dutch related to English or is it related to French? To French. It looks a little bit more like to French. Of course, if I showed you this set of data, you would absolutely have no trouble in saying that it was French because there's nothing that suggests it's English. And if I showed you, uh, on the other hand, if I excluded the, all the uh, features 4, 5, 6, and 7, <coughs> you'd have no trouble saying that it's related to English. So we can very easily manipulate the results if we're even the slightest bit dishonest. At which point, of course, the suggestion is you've got to just take an objective sample of data, either completely code everything that you can code, or use someone else's feature set. Um, as soon as you're using your own feature sets, uh, I, if you want, will accuse you of bias. Uh, two databases I'm drawing on, phonotactics things, one of which has shamelessly recoded the Waffles data set in a more tractable fashion and increased the coverage. 
so we can start spotting patterns. This is a map showing the distribution of genitives before nouns they modify, the person's house, and in blue, genitives following nouns, the house of the person, and purple is both. And if I, we zoom back into the Western Pacific, we can see some very, very, very clear aerial patterns. It's pretty unambiguous that right here is where red begins, and it doesn't begin there. Does that region look like anything to you from other maps we've seen today? It's, yeah. uh, mm, it's similar to the regularity in yeah. the, uh, retaining the Austronesian uh, lexicon. Retaining lexicon? Very good up here, not good there. Uh, showing regular sound correspondence. Excellent along that corridor, very erratic out here. But they're seeing a reasonable level of alignment of map here. Yes, Peter. Well, already the preceding map of the same car, I was wondering whether that, whether that corresponds more or less to the no, it's a not bad match, but it's not perfect here, and it's not perfect here either. Uh, plus, questions about Central and Eastern and Polynesian, but leaving them aside, no, it's not a perfect correspondence. It's close, I admit. But Central and Eastern Malay Polynesian is a subgroup that runs here, here, and out. And we see red and blue on both sides, so it doesn't quite work. But, the, not going for a 100% match, but the overall impression that this map is not dissimilar from the map of lexical retention, it is not dissimilar from the map of regularity of sound correspondence, suggests that, as we suggested earlier, there's some kind of contact situation here, some kind of event, be it language shift, be it, who knows, we'll discuss this more on Friday, but we have very good evidence by looking at these different kinds of data independently, very good evidence that things are not right out here. If we talk about Austronesian as a family, it works well, except for when it fails. And there are many ways it can fail when you look at it the right way. The ones in purple are possibly the most interesting since they're showing us those languages which allow both orders. If we take these to be Austronesian languages in a contact situation, they've adapted perfectly to their environment. They're perfectly negotiating the bureaucracy of social engagement by doing whatever fits. We can pop in a line here showing you where Austronesian boundaries are. Austronesian inside, and then more out there, but I'll ignore them for the moment. And there's non-Austronesians here, but my point is, they are mapping non-Austronesians as they get close to a non-Austronesian area. It has to be contact of some sort, but there's just no other explanation. Up on the mainland, well, you can't spot the, here either, you cannot spot the Austronesian versus non-Austronesian border in terms of the geography. All you see is a lot of noun genitive orders, and then as you approach the areas where tibeto burman languages are more common, you start to see genitive noun. China and in the Himalayas. While the comparative method is our gold standard, and while we can't ignore it, and while the beautiful case study by Owen between the Rote and Meta languages that we saw earlier was drawn purely on the application of the comparative method, I think we have enough trouble with it that we have to start doing something else as well. And this will be what we start doing on the Thank you. Can you go back to are, are, are we are you taking questions now? Yes. Um, can you go back to the the, the, the study you just referenced where uh, you thought showed these two different sets of correspondences? Oh, the sound correspondences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Edwards. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, who knows? Uh, this is the pattern we get from examining. Uh, yeah, go, 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 go further. Uh, so go further to the end. You see, not to the beginning, but to the end. Yes, let's say this. Whatever. So are you? So so you're saying that there are two histories here. 
that you can see. Yes. And they both conform with the with the uh, comparative method. They are both uncovered by application of the comparative method. Okay, good point. Um, so when he examined and, yeah, right. the Austronesian roots, we find one set of sound correspondences, and in the same languages, in the same semantic fields, etymas that do not have Austronesian roots show different sound correspondences. So what, what is the explanation of that? Is, is it that there was a population there that had inherited these uh, the, uh, these items from somewhere else, and uh, had um, had developed had diversified according to unknown process, and then exactly these uh, these items were uh, loaned into um, into the, to the language that then um, covered everything, or are you, are you proposing a different scenario because? I can't think of a... Maybe I'm just not seeing it. So the scenario that Owen reluctantly proposes, because Owen only graduated two years ago, and he doesn't want to make too many waves too soon, but the scenario he reluctantly proposes is the Austronesian roots are established through external comparison, and they're regular. Their correspondences are regular. Therefore, those roots must have been acquired from an Austronesian source at a, some distant time in the past before they diversified. The roots which do not have Austronesian etymo, let's just say equally old, because we have no evidence one way or the other, but the roots which do not have Austronesian etymo are not going to be attested elsewhere on Timor or on the islands to the east. He had not looked north yet, but my impression, I've worked north there, is that they won't be found there either. The, the etymo that are not Austronesian are, he suggests, the original lexemes of the language. The original? The original lexemes of the language group, shall we say. Spoken here. So a language that's indigenous to this yeah. area has a set of correspondences or develops a set of correspondence with its vocabulary. But at a decent or low time in the past, 2,000 years, 3,000 years, I don't know, Austronesian and Etima enter the area and are acquired. Why would they be acquired? Well, Austronesia, the, the period at which we believe Austronesians entered the area was a period of massive uptake of trade. So clearly there was a, an economic advantage to participating in that linguistic sphere. The Austronesian Etima arrived, and they're here in the proto language, such that they can spread out, but they're spreading out in a different set of social movements. Recall the subgrouping that these two different correspondences set show are different subgroups. So these lexemes must have been consciously manipulated in some sense, or at least consciously separated by these social groups using them. These etima were known to be, oh, that's the outsider's language. We're happy to start doing these sound changes. But don't you dare change a native K in the same way. This is attested across a range of semantic fields. It's also attested uh, in bound morphology. So, Agreement prefixes in this language, which are etymologically plausibly Austronesian, show these correspondences, whereas uh, valency deriving suffixes, which are not etymologically Austronesian, show these set of correspondences. But clearly, there's a level of manipulation of, if you like, language internal correspondence mimicry going on. Let's follow up, because maybe I misunderstood part of it previous part of the presentation, but I thought you were saying that uh, regularity was assessed against uh, Austronesian groups. Uh, so when I conducted my study, I did. This is a different study. Yeah, yeah right, right. So if we go back to the previous step, uh, not necessarily with the slide, it's not, not, not that necessary. So the logic there was that you have languages with higher uh, coefficient of regularity and lower coefficient of regularity and uh, something is going on there with lower coefficient of regularity and then we assume that some kind of conflict uh, uh, took place or some kind of language, we don't know. Uh, so my question is basically the same as Rupert's uh, in terms of, I understand very well uh, the scenario, not, not very well, but lots of possible scenarios which may lead to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to a development of a new 
row of correspondences out of the Lick's lexicon taken from the substratum. But I don't see very well the scenario which leads to a decrease of regularity uh, among Austronesian, Austronesian items uh, in the languages. Uh, yeah. So if we take the language of Sumba, which is somewhere at the roughly 60-65% regularity level, the scenario which I personally subscribe to, as was suggested from the back, is a case of language shift or at least relaxification. And if you imagine me sitting on my island here happily, growing my crops and weaving my cloths, and then this influential trader comes along and mentions that she will give me 10 units of currency per cloth, and the word for uh, 10 is puluk, and she pronounces it as, how do you want to change this word? Fulu. It's pronounced with an F here. I learned that word with an F. And later, it's another word with a P. I shouldn't have chosen that, should I? Um, some word with a P acquires, and this trader comes around the next year, and instead of, I already know the word Fulu, and that's close enough to the way she says Fulu, but then she discusses something else with a P with me. At that point, uh, uh, doves. She, she's selling doves, which are punai. And she calls them punai, not funai. And I'll say, sure, I'll tra trade my cloth for your punai. At that point, I've acquired, and the word, the etymology punai and the etymology puluk have been acquired by me as uh, punai and funu. And from this top down perspective, my correspondences are, are irregular. Okay, so, in this sense, the scenario behind this is not just a level shift, but it involves some kind of inter family uh, contact. Multiple That's, contacts yeah, yeah. within the family, yeah. And, and, and between the family and from the other languages. So, so, yeah. but it, it, and the question of whether we want to call this language shift or relaxification or a blend of both yeah. is. So, in principle, it could be the other option of, option of scenario would be that you have two varieties of Tunisian and there is a language shift from one variety to another one. Also, the same yeah. 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 also, also, could be that. The argument against that, because that, that is the, the obvious, simplest explanation. The argument against that comes when we start examining that essential nature argument and we notice that these languages are also the languages that, in addition to not showing very regular correspondences, start showing grammatical characteristics which are unheard of back in Taiwan. So in addition to a different order of the genitive and the noun, we see agreement rather than case marking, we see SVO rather than VOS, etc, etc, etc. With nothing else, I would follow your scenario as the simplest explanation. There's been loan words from another related language. With everything else, we start having to look at some level of language shift combined with multiple relaxification events. And once we've hit that point, we, we have a hard time deciding which language family we actually assign things to. In other words, the evidence is no longer overwhelming in one direction or another. One more, more small question. Uh, if we look at, at your story from the perspective of the evolution of the uh, classical European comparative studies, uh, imagine ourselves in the time. Uh, it's not. It's not that I object. I just it kind of word of caution in a sense. Uh, imagine ourselves back before the awareness flow was discovered. So in this case, we would think that there is some kind of regular correspondence, and we would like to. We would try to find some kind of some. Uh, some kind of contact explanation to that, and instead Werner, Werner, uh, Werner comes later with a non-absolute but a pretty uh, neat law which explains these what we consider to be irregularities by some kind of additional, yeah. uh, additional condition. So then I think that, that would be a, a conventional answer of a traditional comparative to what your presentation. So what would your... So when not uh, examining this regularity idea, I of course was allowing for environments to condition the reflexes. So the first response would be, we're already looking at any plausible phonetic environments when examining these things. The second response would be, let's see, one, we're taking account of the environment already. Two, yes, we can always add in lexeme-specific or effectively lexeme-specific uh, conditions on sound change, but we've lost explanatory power to a very large level at that point. But three, and this is the most critical three, 
we would have to set up these specific rules on a language by language basis. So the level of explanation in terms of subgrouping we're getting is nil. Yeah. So it's not that we suddenly find, oh, in this lexeme, uh, Hulu becomes Hulu where we expected it, Hulu. We maybe find it here, but not here. Here, but not here. It's completely erratic. So if you don't have any other questions, we need to thank, thank you, Mark. Thank you.